Words. They're just words. In Turkey, President Erdogan uses words to describe journalists he doesn't like. He calls them ignorant, agents of subversion, foreign spies, terrorists. As of January, at least 151 writers and journalists in Turkey have been arrested and detained without charge or are awaiting trial. Words. In China, censors simply delete the ones they don't like. President Xi Jinping told writers and artists they should work toward promoting party ideology. Nobel laureate Liu Xiaobo penned seven sentences and is serving 11 years in prison. Words. Iranian Shiva Nazar Ahari protested for human rights. Saudi Arabian Ashraf Fayyad wrote a book of poetry. Filmmaker Oleg Sentsov criticized the Russian government. They're still behind bars. Words. Asked how the government might handle journalists who do not stick to the official line, Thailand's Prime Minister, General Prayut Chanocha, used these words. We'll probably just execute them. In Mexico, Pedro Tamayo Rosas, Manuel Torres, Francisco Pachecho, Anabel Flores Salazar, and more than 70 other writers and journalists have been murdered for their words. Words. They're just words. And ideas. And films. And songs. And stories. And research. And internet postings. And Penn's been advocating for them and their authors around the world for almost a century. In countries like Russia, Egypt, Colombia, Bangladesh, and Eritrea. Countries where words are not free, and free thinkers are in danger. So when the President of the United States calls journalists the enemy of the American people, or says a news organization is going to suffer the consequences, when he puts arts and humanities on the chopping block and denies the meaning of words, it reminds us of other words from other leaders and leads us to raise the question, can it happen here? And raise the alarm, it can happen here. Because these aren't just words we're fighting for, they're the lifeblood of our freedom. Words transcend borders and drive our curiosity. They're how we share, understand others, tell stories, and come together. Words allow us to know. They allow us to wonder, to kid, to joke, to celebrate, to love. Words are truth, and they deserve protection. Protection in Myanmar, in Mexico, in Russia, in Turkey and right here in America. We need to be strong for words, and to be strong, we must come together. Pen America, louder together. I'm Suzanne Nossel. I'm the CEO of PEN America. And I'm also a proud former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State working under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So what do you say to introduce someone who we all know by her first name? and who so many of us revere. Her soaring triumphs and soul-crushing challenges are etched in our minds and hearts, just as they are in her own. I can't add to the headlines of the history books, so I'll speak more personally. I came into her orbit in 2007 when she first ran for president. It was through Richard Holbrook, a former boss and a force of nature who was determined to get her elected. I'll always be grateful that he pulled me into that campaign. Fast forward three years later, I was working at the State Department when devastating news came. Holbrook, then the US Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, had suffered a catastrophic aortic rupture during a meeting in Secretary Clinton's office. He was rushed into surgery as colleagues, friends, and world leaders held vigil. When the worst happened, there were a group of us standing in a quivering clump in the hospital lobby, crying, hugging, and reminiscing. In walked Secretary Clinton. It was after nine at night. 
That day, she'd held meetings up in Ottawa and hosted the entire Washington Diplomatic Corps for a holiday party. After comforting the family, we expected she'd be whisked off to rest and mourn in private, having just lost one of her closest aides. Instead, she stayed with us, a ragtag group of bereft former staff at a loss for what to do. Secretary Clinton then demonstrated to all of us her acumen in a crisis. Let's all go to a bar, she said. <laughs> and for hours, she sat. She had us all laughing with the tale of how Holbrook once emerged from a cabin on her plane wearing a pair of footsie pajamas. She then coaxed the most junior aides to tell their own silly stories. How did you first meet him? She was patient, curious, empathic, and totally engaged. She focused not on her grief, but on all of ours. When we considered inviting Secretary Clinton to deliver PEN America's Arthur Miller Freedom to Write lecture, I realized not everyone would necessarily think her an obvious choice. So I revisited a memo that collected her human rights accomplishments as Secretary of State. It was 24 pages long, with detailed, specific, and consequential achievements on every region of the world. <laughs> Rereading it brought tears to my eyes, thinking of the progress now in jeopardy and of what might have been. Just last week, the term reproductive rights was expunged from the State Department's annual human rights report. This memo included a whole section on protecting internet freedom, a then novel concept that Hillary Clinton made mainstream. She established it as a globally recognized human right through groundbreaking speeches, meticulously constructed and argued. There was a chapter in the memo on LGBT rights where she did the same, proclaiming gay rights are human rights at the United Nations for the first time. There were points in there on defending free speech at the UN, in Europe, and in the Muslim world, on protecting human rights defenders, and of course, advancing women's rights. I was privileged to work on some of those efforts, like rallying recalcitrant governments to tackle homophobic violence and prejudice, and forging compromise to blunt calls for a global ban on insults to religion. Her leadership was instinctive and unflinching as when a Florida pastor threatened to burn a Quran, triggering riots as far off as Afghanistan. She condemned him in the strongest possible terms, yet recognized that the First Amendment did not allow him to be, pro pro for him to be prohibited or punished. No record's perfect, but there can be no question that her efforts helped secure the freedom to write for tens of millions worldwide. Her approach, deeply researched, tightly reasoned speeches and statements, marshalling facts, potent words, invoking precedent and history, all to advance rights, is at the essence of PEN America's mission, to use our powers of speech to enable and safeguard those of others. The idea that words can change the world and that the freedom to write underpins all other liberties. This room is living testament to the power of words. In February 1860, Abraham Lincoln came to this very stage to give the distinguished lecture that launched his national political career. His was the inaugural Freedom to Write lecture long before there was a Penn or an Arthur Miller. His address became famous, not for his charisma nor his fancy turns of phrase, as his law partner put it then, no former effort in the line of speech making had cost Lincoln so much time and thought as this one. He'd gone and examined the views of 39 signatories to the Constitution about slavery, as profound an issue of rights as our nation has ever confronted. He analyzed their statements and actions to mount an airtight case that the Founding Fathers recognized the federal government's power to regulate slavery in new territories. So now, at a time when the media, facts, truth, and words themselves are being debased, Lincoln's echoes remind us 
that when we come to events like the Penn World Voices Festival, it's not just to listen and learn, but to be stirred to action. In 2018, the freedom to write is not just a tagline, but a rallying cry. Hillary Clinton and Abraham Lincoln share a doggedness, a craving for justice, but perhaps above all, a readiness to give forth every ounce of intellect, hour of research, an increment of energy for what they believe. At times like these, we depend on those who have that innate, unrelenting courage to help summon the same from deep within the rest of us, to use their words to kindle our conscience. As Lincoln said here, let us stand by our duty fearlessly and effectively. Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us. Now, Hillary Clinton knows something about that. <laughs> he went on, let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. Let's face it, our faith in this country that right makes might has been shaken over the last 18 months. But as Lincoln points out, that belief cannot be a static article of faith. It's rather a call to duty. Only by fulfilling that duty can his hearkening to faith be vindicated. As defenders of the freedom to write, we in Pen America's community have a duty to stand vigilant, to storm the barricades, to mobilize others, because the more we rouse, the more robust our defense. At the end of Lincoln's Cooper Union Address, the crowd exploded into wild cheering, waving hats and handkerchiefs. With that image in mind, and no further ado, I offer our former Senator and Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It, uh, it's uh, such a great honor to be here, and I want to start by thanking Suzanne. I've had the privilege of following her career over the years, including, as she said, working alongside her at the State Department. And you will not find a more passionate champion for human rights, free expression, and diplomacy. And I'm thrilled that she is at the helm of this important organization at this time. You know, in just a few minutes, after I complete some remarks, I'm going to have a conversation with someone else uh, who shares that passion, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who will be... who will be talking with me about some of the issues that are on all of our minds, uh, because this Penn World Voices is particularly important this year. It should go without saying, but I'll say it. Celebrating and protecting the power of the written word is more important at this moment than any time in recent history. And this year's theme, Resist and Reimagine, goes right to the heart of why we are at such a critical time. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing to come here tonight uh, about the uh, namesake for this lecture, Arthur Miller, a longtime Penn leader, who said so many important and thought-provoking things, but one in particular struck me uh, because it had such a vivid image. The apple cannot be stuck back on the tree of knowledge once we begin to see, we are doomed and challenged to seek the strength to see more 
not less. Miller wrote that in 1964. Now that was long before the internet, social media, cable news, but it was during another tumultuous time in American history. And while he may not have envisioned all of that technology and the changes in delivering information, the sentiment still applies. Seeing more has its challenges. Today, the constant barrage of information swirling around us can make it difficult to focus, digest, prioritize, but it also opens up the world. And the more we see, the more we are able to recognize and appreciate the increasing complexity of the problems we face and hopefully find ways to solve them. Consider what happened at a Starbucks in Philadelphia a few weeks ago. Someone witnessed an injustice and took out a phone to document it. Millions of views later, it got the world's attention and sparked a very public, important conversation. Now Starbucks is going to close 8,000 stores and hold racial bias training for 175,000 workers. Now, that won't fix all systemic racism, but it is certainly a positive step. Arthur Miller also said, I think the job of the artist is to remind people of what they have chosen to forget. That's what Starbucks is doing. That's what the people in this room and your members across the country do every day. You help us see more and remind us of what we have chosen to forget. Through plays and poetry, journalism, books, essays, and articles, you shine a light on the human condition, help us understand more about the world around us, challenge us to understand views and experiences different from our own, and remind us of the importance of evidence-based facts. You know, you are artists and truth-tellers, and that may not always make us comfortable. In fact, sometimes it is your job to make us uncomfortable. And as someone who's been on the receiving end of some of those books and essays and articles over the years, I can attest to that. But it does bring to mind that quote that we all learned in school, which we probably should pull out and display prominently, you know, Voltaire's, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So the mission of Penn to defend free expression has never been more urgent. We are living through an era of unprecedented threats to free speech, open discourse, and the rights of marginalized communities. According to Freedom House, an organization dedicated to protecting free speech and human rights around the world, 2016 was the lowest point for global press freedom in over a decade. 2017 was one of the most dangerous years on record to be a journalist. 18 journalists were killed and a record number were imprisoned. As we gather here tonight, there are 189 journalists in prison around the world. And the stories are chilling. In Myanmar, two reporters, Walon and Jo U, are being held without bail for investigating the brutal genocide of the Rohingya people. In Mexico, journalists covering the country's drug war have been killed and imprisoned, not only by drug cartels, but by corrupt officials. In Turkey, at least five news agencies, 62 newspapers, 16 television channels, 29 publishing houses, and 24 radio stations have been shut down since the coup in 2016. And Wikipedia 
has been permanently blocked. In China, journalists face some of the harshest and most sophisticated censorship anywhere. And in Russia, a little less than a week ago, a journalist who had been investigating the country's military activities in Syria died mysteriously after falling from the window of his fifth floor apartment, the latest incident in a disturbing pattern. Putin's Russia is an epicenter of a cowardly war on the free press that has had dangerous and deadly consequences for democracy, all because Putin and his fellow dictators are afraid to brave the scrutiny that a free press brings. They claim they're being strong, but their fear of being challenged proves the opposite. Only brittle regimes and dictators are so afraid of being challenged. But need I say, this isn't a problem that's relegated to other parts of the world. Right here in America, press rights, journalism, and free speech under, are under open assault in the most perilous position I've seen in my lifetime. I loved when Suzanne was talking about Lincoln's remarkable speech here in Cooper Union in 1860, where he did go back and research our founders, those who debated and wrote and signed the Constitution. Well, those founders spent a lot of time talking about the necessity of a free press. Thomas Jefferson famously said, our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without being lost. Ben Franklin, writing for the Pennsylvania Gazette, said that freedom of speech is a principal pillar of a free government. When this support is taken away, the constitution of a free society is dissolved. And John Adams called the freedom of the press essential to the security of the state. Well, today we have a president who seems to reject the role of a free press in our democracy. Although obsessed with his own press coverage, he evaluates it based not on whether it provides knowledge or understanding, but solely on whether the daily coverage helps him and hurts his opponents. He has referred to the media as an enemy of the people. He has suggested that broadcast licenses of some news networks should be challenged. He wants to block the sale of CNN to AT&T for the same reason. And he has repeatedly threatened Amazon because Jeff Bezos also owns the Washington Post, a newspaper defying the odds and showing what many thought was a dying business model can be a success with good reporting and the innovative use of technology. Now, given his track record, is it any surprise that according to the latest round of revelations, he joked about throwing reporters in jail to make them talk. And it doesn't stop there. This administration has also tried to gut the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. As Suzanne has pointed out, the reason for doing this can't be fiscal, since combined, they make up less than one hundredth of one percent of the federal budget. Instead, these attacks on the arts and humanities are a clear attempt to undermine the American ideals of self-expression, knowledge, dissent, criticism, and truth. And perhaps one of the most jarring developments, one that should set off alarm bells for anyone concerned about freedom of speech, was the announcement just a few weeks ago that the Department of Homeland Security will begin monitoring the activities of reporters and media professionals. It's not a coincidence that copies of George Orwell's 1984 and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale are flying off the shelves. It's a warning. For anyone who thinks our country isn't vulnerable to propaganda or attempts to suppress free expression, you only have to look at the 2016 election, 
which was a case study in the weaponization of false information and outright lies against our democracy. We now know that Russian agents used Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, even Pinterest <clears throat> I still am trying to figure that one out. <laughs> but they use these very well-trafficked sites to place targeted attack ads and negative stories, intended not only to hurt me, but more importantly and lastingly, to fan the flames of division within our society. They pose as Americans pretending to be gun rights and Black Lives Matter activists, they even held phony demonstrations. Now, the Russian disinformation campaign was successful in part because America's natural defenses have been worn down over the years by powerful interests that want to make it harder for us to distinguish between fact and fiction. And it's been abetted to some degree by the way politics has been covered. We are living through an all-out war on truth, facts, and reason. When leaders deny things we can see with our own eyes, like the size of a crowd at the inauguration, <laughs> or, <clears throat> when they refuse to accept settled science when it comes to urgent challenges like climate change, it's not just frustrating to those of us who try to live in a fact-based universe. It is the beginning of the end of freedom. And that's not hyperbole. It's what authoritarian regimes throughout history have done. They attempt to control reality, not just our laws and policies, but our thoughts and beliefs. This really matters because if our leaders lie about the problems we face, we will not only never solve them, we will no longer know what to believe. It matters because it undermines confidence in government as a whole, which breeds cynicism and anger. And it does matter because our country was founded on those principles of the Enlightenment, in particular, the belief that people possess the capacity for reason and critical thinking, and that free and open debate is the lifeblood of democracy. We not only shouldn't, we must not abandon these fundamental ideals. Instead, we should revere, protect, and promote them in everything we do. For years, America has led by example when it comes to free speech, a free press, and protecting the First Amendment. The fact that our leadership is going backwards sends a message to the world that maybe these rights aren't so sacred after all, potentially opening the door for authoritarian regimes to go even further than they already have, knowing America may not be there to push back and serve as that example. The good news is an open, inclusive, diverse society is the opposite of and the antidote to a closed society where there is only one right way to think, believe, and act. I saw this firsthand as Secretary of State. Places on earth that have an open, free press and where journalists are safe, even when taking on powerful people, those are places where women and minority groups are safer, environmental concerns are addressed, and democracy is stronger. That's why we made advancing human rights, freedom of expression, and internet freedom priorities. I believed then, and believe even more fiercely today, that this is where America needs to lead. And since we don't have an ally in the White House, we have to do everything we can as citizens. Earlier this month, we saw a tangible example of the decline in independent news sources across the country when the Sinclair Broadcast Group, the country's biggest owner of local TV stations, required hundreds of affiliates to recite the same on-air editorial 
about one-sided, fake stories. Yet we know, and research has shown, that local stations bought by Sinclair actually reduce their coverage of local politics because their goal is to shift the ideological tone of their coverage to the right, and in this case, in support of the current administration. But it can't only be journalists who stand up and speak out. We all can do more. We can subscribe to newspapers. We can call out actual fake news when we see it and speak out against it. We can support libraries and schools that teach media literacy to young people and empower them to be thoughtful readers and consumers of news. We can support innovative ideas like the Report for America initiative, a new collaboration that draws on programs like the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, Teach for America, and public media, and aims to help get 1,000 journalists in local newsrooms over the next five years. And for anyone who's wondering what more we can do, Pan America has put together a fantastic list that should be required reading for everyone who is worried. I find that when one is worried, finding some action to take does diminish the worry. Because these are hard times for everyone who cares about democracy and human rights. But despite everything, we've seen some very courageous reporting. Journalists in many areas are rising to the occasion. You know, when the latest Pulitzer Prizes were given out, we saw how journalists had transformed our national conversation and sparked massive social change. American journalists have cast a bright light on sexual harassment and assault, exposed corruption, brought attention to attempts by this administration to erase data on everything from climate change to women's health. Journalists have poured over financial records, bills, and tax returns when they can get them to inform and educate people <laughs> about who is running our country. And some media outlets have even taken the brave step of publicly examining issues that plague their own newsrooms and their reporting, especially during election season. Now, this is laudable <clears throat> and very important <clears throat> because we know from some recent studies what the alternatives look like. The study of media coverage by Harvard's Berkman Klein Center and the Columbia Journalism Reviews Analysis have done a good job in documenting the coverage of the 2016 campaign, showing how the mainstream political coverage was influenced by the right-wing media ecosystem and other factors to depart from normal journalistic standards. Our longest standing scholar of the relationship between the presidency and the media, Professor Thomas Patterson, called the false equivalency in the coverage corrosive and says the relentlessly negative news has had a leveling effect that opens the doors to charlatans. Now, thankfully, in the races since 2016, coverage has been more straightforward and fact-based, perhaps because the races were close and inherently more exciting. But I believe it also reflects an effort to avoid the errors that helped Mr. Trump to the White House. And I hope we'll see more of this in the years to come. Just last week, I sat down with four inspiring people, women journalists who are also activists, truth seekers, truth tellers, calling attention to what is happening in our world, especially because of the rise of strong men who are curtailing freedom and democracy. One is reporting on abuses by the Russian government Another is exposing human rights violations in Georgia. Another has been sounding the alarm for years about what's happening in Turkey and its rising tide of authoritarianism. The fourth is calling out corruption in China. Each of these remarkable women described the repression that they face, the threat of physical danger, the grave personal risks but their commitment to standing up for free speech, free expression, equality, a free press, 
ideas that are considered by powerful people to be subversive, radical, even dangerous, is unwavering. No matter what they face, they have refused to give in or allow their voices to be silenced. And so must we. My good friend and predecessor, Madeleine Albright, <clears throat> has just published a book called Fascism, A Warning. Madeline knows of what she speaks, having as a child to first flee from the Nazis in Czechoslovakia, and then after the war, returning home only to have to flee from the communists. She believes in the marrow of her bones, the importance of educating ourselves about what happens when freedom is slowly eroded. Professor Timothy Snyder at Yale wrote first a little book shortly after the election called On Tyranny. His expertise is in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, particularly between the First and Second World Wars. He has just come out with a new book, called The Road to Unfreedom. These are not alarmist people. These are thoughtful scholars, public officials, who have given great thought to what is happening in our own country. So just as Arthur Miller wrote all those years ago, we have to seek the strength to see more, not less. We have to find our voice in whatever way we are most comfortable to speak out. Suzanne quoted the end of Lincoln's speech, and it's worth hearing again because although that was a very different time and our country was facing the most serious crisis in its history, the words of warning and the call to action should be heard and acted upon today. He ended his quite scholarly, more than one hour speech about how the federal government had the right to control the spread of slavery. By starting a paragraph saying, human nature doesn't change, but human actions can. And then ending that glorious speech by saying, let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. If nothing else, think about your duty as you understand it. For those who cherish and practice the freedom to write, Think about how best you can use your talents, your skills and experience and fulfilling your duty on behalf of freedom and human rights, on behalf of the bedrock values of the United States. For the rest of us, do not be intimidated or bullied into not speaking. I've had some experience with that as well. And I know for sure that everyone's voices need to be raised at this time. And so I leave you with a note of gratitude for the extraordinary work that Penn does and a big thank you for all you do, each and every one of you, to protect the essential freedoms that underpin our country, our society, and our democracy. Do not grow weary. Be sustained by the energy that the truth can give you. And as the theme of this conference reminds us, resist and reimagine, because I have no doubt we will get our country back on the right track. Thank you all.
they have to now do a whole dance like this. They're pulling this away. The chairs, are they bringing the chairs back? Are they bringing the chairs out? Away, bring the two chairs out. And, uh, I'll introduce. Okay, table. Getting there. Okay. And so, there's a. <laughs> <laughs> and now I just want to very briefly introduce Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She's the author. The author of the novels Purple Hibiscus, which won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, Half of a Yellow Sun, which won the Orange Prize, Americana, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, and her most recent book, Dear Ijewele, or A Feminist Manifesto and 15 Suggestions, published in March of 2017, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Thank you. It is such an honor for me to be sitting here with you. And I have to say that when I said hello to Ms. Clinton backstage, I had to try very hard not to get emotional. And I almost feel like I'm getting emotional now. I think your speech was proof that you would have been a damn good president. <laughs> I think that the, the, the source of my, my um, feeling emotional and, and feeling something close to distress is just thinking, I can't believe this is what we don't have, and I can't believe what we have instead. But, so I want to start, <laughs> I want, so I want to start by talking about, um, in your memoir, Living History, you wrote that, and I'm going to quote here, I'm not the sort of person who routinely pours out her deepest feelings. And I'm hoping that this evening will be different. <laughs> <laughs> that you will pour out your deepest feelings to me. But, but more seriously, more seriously, I wondered about that because I, I realized that what you were describing is a certain reserve that is your nature. But I wondered whether you think that you might have had to develop that reserve, even if you hadn't been born with it, because of the experiences that you've had as a public figure. Well, I think that's um, a, a really good way of asking the question because um, I do think it's a combination of uh, perhaps my innate uh, reserve, my temperament, and the experiences that um, I've had, which have, by and large, no grounds for complaint, but have been somewhat uh, taxing and, in the political realm, uh, quite um, you know, brutal from time to time. But I, I think it's also the age in which I was raised and became a young woman. And it's hard to separate out all these different factors. So, although I was fortunate to have parents who encouraged me to follow my interests and to get an education and to speak up. And yet, in the atmosphere growing up in the 1950s and the early 1960s, that was, that was challenging for a young woman. And so we were pretty much taught from an early age that the worst thing you can do if you're going to you know, try to be competitive, you're going to try to go farther than in my case, my mother or other people's uh, experiences would lead, you can't show your emotions. You can't be angry. You can't cry. You can't do a lot of the things that are part of natural human responses. And in my book, What Happened, I have a whole chapter called On Being a Woman in Politics. And I use some examples, not only from my own life, but others as well. So trying to walk that line is still 
more challenging, I think, for women, and my own experiences and my own temperament, I'm sure, added to that. So um, just before the elections, I wrote a piece about you. And if you'll humor me, I'd like to read a few paragraphs and then talk about it. So when I sent out this piece, it was titled, I titled it, Why is Hillary Clinton so widely loved? And I'm going to read two, um, <laughs> two <laughs> I want to read two, um, two very short paragraphs from it, just the, the beginning. We do not see often enough the people who love Hillary Clinton, who support her because of her qualifications rather than because of her unqualified opponent, who empathize with her. Yet millions of Americans, women and men, love her intelligence, her industriousness, her grit. They feel loyal to her. They will vote with enthusiasm for her. Human, human, human beings change as they grow, but a person's history speaks to who she is. There are millions who admire the tapestry of Hillary Clinton's past. The first ever student commencement speaker at Wellesley, speaking boldly about making the impossible possible. The Yale law student interested in the rights of migrant farm workers. The lawyer working with the Children's Defense Fund. The first lady trying to make health care accessible for all Americans. There are people who love how cleanly she slices through policy layers, how thoroughly she digests the small print. They remember that she won two terms to the United States Senate, where she was not only well regarded, but was known to get along with Republicans. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> They have confidence in her. There are people who rage at the media on her behalf, who see the coverage she too often receives as unfair. There are people who, in a quiet, human way, wish her well. There are people who, when Hillary Clinton becomes the first woman to be president of the United States, will weep from joy. And so... <laughs> so <clears throat> And so when I, when I, when I sent this um, to, I, I was struck by how much, how much back and forth happened with the editing, particularly with the title. I was told, oh, we can't have that title. And, and I said, well, why can't we? It's an opinion piece, right? That's what I think. <laughs> and, right, I mean, really, but, but I remember being struck. I have, I mentioned the people who rage on your behalf at the media coverage. I am one of those people. But until then, I hadn't quite realized how much um, it just seemed to be, to be insidious. And in the end, that, that title was changed because somehow I, 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 was, I, I was silenced, I was censored. <laughs> so I want, I, I want to talk to you about um, how, how, do you, how did you keep going on? Right? I mean, seriously, knowing that constantly the, the discourse around your candidacy became about likability for example, and who likes her and who doesn't like her. And I kept thinking, who the hell cares? She's qualified. Right? And, and, and so, but, it, but, but even that continues. So even now that you're not running, so recently they said you had said something in India about Wisconsin being backwards, and you hadn't. In context, you'd said something very different. But it seems to me that repeating um, untruths about you, it, it means that somehow they take on a certain kind of, I don't know, potency. And, and, I, and I wonder about you. I sometimes would read the news and think, is she okay? How is she? <laughs> <laughs> because, I, I mean, really, tell me, tell me about that. <laughs> well, to some extent, this is uh, a bit of a mystery to me as well. Um, now, for 25 years, ever since I've been uh, in the public spotlight nationally, uh, there has been a very concerted effort to just, you know, attack me, spread falsehoods about me and the like, which I knew was going on and which do take a toll. They take a toll not only on me, but they take a toll on people's views about me, because when you have so many absurd 
lies being propagated about you, you come to know that even when they are easily disprovable, uh, there's a lingering doubt that people have. And, you know, I, I, I'm not done, and I will, I will, you know, say this clearly as I feel it, I've not done or figured out a way to combat that effectively. Mm -hmm. And I felt so terrible during this last campaign when so many people who supported me literally had to hide their support. Yes. They joined you know, groups on Facebook and immediately just a swarm of Russian bots and other you know, crit critics would descend upon them and make terrible, uh, terrible accusations against them because they were supporting me. And so it moved into kind of a, a, a hidden mm. sanctuary so people could say, I really support her or I really agree with her. Um, I don't know quite why, um, why I provoke that kind of overreaction. And so much of the, uh, so many of the accusations against me are so absurd. But then in retrospect, when I was writing my book and looking at all the research, enough people believed them. Yeah. You know, they believed the most outlandish, ridiculous stories that I was running a child sex trafficking ring out of the basement of a pizzeria. I mean, <laughs> you, you laugh, but people it, believed it yes. because it was, as I said in my remarks, it was weaponized. And it was delivered to people who the very smart manipulators behind that knew might be affected. Um, you know, just, you know, just the other day, um, I looked at an Ohio State analysis about what were the three stories that led people who had supported President Obama to either not vote or um, staying, staying at home or voting for a third party or maybe even voting uh, for Trump. But most stayed home or, or, and didn't vote or voted uh, third party. And the three were that I was dying, you know, a very <laughs> constant theme. And you may not have seen it, but it was very much in the atmosphere. The second was that the Pope had endorsed Trump. And the third was that I was supplying weapons to ISIS. Now, why do people believe that? Well, partly because those stories are delivered in a way that looks like news. And so I don't, I don't blame voters. I don't blame people who receive that on their Facebook feed or their Twitter account or however they receive it, thinking, well, oh, I don't know. And even when contrary information is presented, like I'm still here, I haven't died yet, um, <laughs> thankfully. And, um, and, and you know, the pizzeria didn't even have a basement, but... Um, <laughs> You know, you, 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 you just have to wonder, how do we stop this? And obviously I'm concerned not just because of me, I'm concerned because we're living in a time when information can be so powerful and if it's wrong or it's intended to influence you to do something that is not reality-based but based instead on propaganda, that's a problem that we have to deal with going forward. And it seems to me it was the reason that you've chosen to keep speaking. Yes. yes. I'm so happy that you've made that choice. And um, I, want, I want to talk about the connection between free speech and feminism, because we're talking about free speech here. And, and obviously, it's important to talk about sort of the dramatic and political examples. But, but what about this idea that often the response you get is one of silencing, where constantly people have said since the elections, you need to be quiet, you need to go away, and I'm talking about people on the right and the left, often people on the left who should know better. And, I, I mean, it, it, it seems, and I, I can't help but read that as, 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 a, com, as, as a feminist issue. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm a feminist who doesn't think that everything is about feminism, right? There are some things that are not, just maybe two things in the world. But, um, <laughs> but, 
But I think that this one in particular, I'm struck by how a lot of the narrative, a lot of what you, when your book came out, for example, and I took my time and I read some of the coverage, and I, I found myself being disappointed, actually, by, by people on the left who should know better, saying you need to be silent, you need to go away, uh, the Democratic Party needs to face forwards and think about the future. And I found myself thinking, Maybe we could ask Ms. Clinton if she could bring the nearly 66 million votes that she got, and then whoever runs can bring in a few more, right? <laughs> so the point being, <laughs> I'm so happy you're not being silent, but, but I want you to talk, if you could, about that decision not to be silent, and, and also how you deal with the constant barrage of, of attempts to silence you. Well, I found this also very curious because, to the best of my memory, no man who ever lost a presidential election was told to shut up and go away. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm very glad they weren't because uh, each had points of view and experiences that were worth hearing about. And so I've given a lot of thought to this, and I do conclude, and as I say, I write about it in my book, that there is this long, long history of trying to silence women. And literally in literature, in the Western canon, it goes back to the Odyssey, where Penelope is holding the whole country together while Odysseus is taking his time getting back from <laughs> the wars. And so she, you know, and she's raising their son, Telemachus. And so Telemachus, there's a very telling scene where, you know, all of the usual courtiers and, and others are hanging around hoping that she'll finally decide that her husband is dead and marry one of them so that they can take over. And Telemachus is now about 17, and so he's a young, young man. And his mother comes down, as she always did, to greet people and listen to their complaints and to continue uh, being the glue that held the, you know, the country together. And her son greets her by saying, Mother, go back upstairs. Speech is not for women. And the really terrific classics professor, Mary Beard, who some of you know, but if you don't, look her up. And she has just written a book about women and power in which she traces this whole line of being quiet, don't speak, don't speak up. Now, for everyone who said, well, that was just a Hillary Clinton problem, you know, the people who'd be interviewed and they'd say, well, of course I would vote for a woman, just not that woman. And now in the last year and a half, what have we seen? We've seen Elizabeth Warren ordered off the floor of the Senate by Mitch McConnell. I was in the Senate for eight years. I never saw that because she was reading a letter from Coretta Scott King about Jeff Sessions and he told her to stop and she had every right not to stop. And when she didn't, he literally had her taken off the floor and one of her male colleagues, a very good guy, another Democratic senator, came to the floor and he began to read the letter and nobody said a word. Or Kamala Harris, who was doing her job in cross-examining Jeff Sessions and in a committee hearing, and basically told to stop talking. Don't do that. So this is not about one woman and one election. This remains a very... Um, serious challenge to women speaking out, speaking up, um, trying to or already assuming uh, positions of power and influence. So when I hear that, um, I hear the echoes going back thousands of years, and I hear the unfortunate um, belief that people still have uh, that women's voices are not particularly appealing, uh, that women's words are not particularly important. And in my case, it was also because a lot of those same people who said don't talk 
they did not want to face what happened in the 2016 election. So getting me off the stage was a way of ignoring everything that had gone on, and I come at it very differently. If we don't understand what happened in that election, we are doomed to see it repeated in future elections. So I think it's a combination of factors mm -hmm. at work. Mm -hmm. It seems, I, I sense a kind of fundamental optimism about you. Um, which <laughs> so are you, are you optimistic about where America is going? And I ask that because of where it is right now. And because I think quite personally that, that there's been a great, um, that there's been great damage done to America's moral authority and that it's, my, my feeling is that it's going to take a long time um, to mend that, even if this person who's president goes away. And so I, I want to know whether you're optimistic and whether you really think there's reason to be optimistic. Well, you're right. I am fundamentally optimistic um, because I believe that there's enough uh, strength and resilience, not only in American institutions, but in the American people uh, to see us through this period but I don't take anything for granted because I agree with you. I think our, our moral authority and therefore our leverage in the world has been diminished. Um, and that is uh, a, a precious resource that we are squandering and it will take a long time to win it back. But our bigger underlying problem is the divisiveness in our own country and the unwillingness for people to work together to try to solve problems, to find common ground wherever possible. Uh, you, you said uh, that, uh, yes, I worked with Republicans. Well, I did because part of the time I was in the majority and part of the time was in the minority. And I thought my job was to further the interests of the people of New York. And so what I try to do was to, to, you know, if not fine, create that common ground. And one funny little anecdote, so I, when I got elected in November of 2000, uh, Trent Lott, the senator from Mississippi, who was then uh, the majority leader for the Republicans, gave an interview and he said, well, maybe lightning will strike her and she won't show up. Well, I showed up. And, um, <laughs> and then by the end of my time in the Senate before going to the State Department, he gave another interview and he said, you know, she was really great to work with and I needed their help after 9-11 to get the resources New York needed to rebuild. They needed my help after Katrina to rebuild the Gulf Coast. So on a lot of really important critical issues uh, that didn't raise everybody's uh, ideological partisan hackles, we were able to find that common ground. It's much harder now. I mean, I talked to my colleagues on both the Democratic and the Republican side, and it's really difficult. When you have a president, you don't know what he's going to tweet, you don't know what he's going to do from day to day. Um, to have any kind of strategy, from either the Republican or the Democratic side, so you do the best you can. And I wish that, I wish we'd have more people say enough, mm -hmm. enough of this partisan nonsense. Mm -hmm. We have some big issues. You know, we're, we're moving into an era where automation and robotics are gonna wipe out millions and millions of jobs. We are totally unprepared for that. Mm -hmm. We are moving into a time where uh, healthcare has still, not been resolved so that people can afford it and be able to access it. We're moving into a time where with the rise of these strong men, America's interests are going to be uh, undermined and certainly what we stand for already is. So there's a long list, whether it's climate change or human rights or anything else that people should be focused on and should say, I'm not going to vote for people who believe compromise is a dirty word. I'm not gonna vote for people who put their commercial, ideological, or religious interests in front of the interests of the United States of America and our efforts to try to solve Amen, problems. Amen, Auntie, amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> amen. 
So you, you describe um, the, the, the president, it's difficult for me to say the name, um, <laughs> the inauguration speech quite beautifully in, uh, I think, your most recent book. You described it as, uh, as undimmed fury, which I thought was quite lovely. <laughs> I mean, if you can describe things of that sort as lovely. But I wanted to, I, I, and so in thinking about you going to that inauguration, God bless you, um, I wouldn't have. And <laughs> but I, so just in looking back, what do you think about the fact that 52% of white women voted for this president? And I say that because we knew he had shown us what he was. We knew. We knew about the, it wasn't just the Access Hollywood tapes. It was also just a way of being and doing in the world. And, and I, think, I think a lot of Democrats in this country, many of whom, those who stayed at home, were so sure that you were going to win. Um, and so I think they thought they could afford to be blasé about it. Um, I remember reading somewhere that journalists were so keen on Bobby Kennedy that they overcompensated by being very critical. And in some ways, I think the Democrats who stayed home were just sort of like, oh, she'll win. Nobody will vote for him, right? But then people did vote for him. And a majority of women who are white voted for him. I ask you this because you're a white woman, <laughs> but also because um, Gloria Steinem in her memoir writes that many of the w women she spoke to when she was campaigning for you during your first campaign for president um, many of the white women who were opposed to you were very similar to you. They were educated, they were middle class, they were about your age, and that she was struck by that. And in reading about Trump, I wondered if these were the same women who had voted for him. And, and she writes, um, Gloria Steinem, in her really lovely memoir, that she tried very hard to then humanize you to them because they thought, oh, she's cold, she's too ambitious, she's all of those things. Um, and do you think about that? I mean, is that something that... Yeah, I, of course I do, because, um, you know, white women, writ large, all white women, have uh, been steadily voting Republican for decades. Um, and I actually got a slightly higher percentage of white women than President Obama got. And so white women have moved toward the Republican Party for a lot of reasons. Um, I think in uh, 2000 and 2004, uh, there were reasons that had to do, especially in 2004, uh, with the 9-11 attack. Uh, in 2008 and 12, uh, President Obama had an amazing campaign and turned out so many people of color that the fact that white women weren't voting for him was not as uh, salient. In my case, I actually got a majority of college-educated white women. And it was, I think, exactly because these were the women who were most worried by what they'd seen of Trump during the campaign. But for other women, particularly women who gravitate in presidential elections toward the Republican Party, there were a combination of explanations. They didn't believe he'd be as bad as he said. They thought it was all political rhetoric. They thought that he would bring real change. And when you, and as I say in my book, when you run to succeed a two-term president of your own party, it's always an uphill struggle. So I think there were a number of factors at work uh, in that. But what we have seen with the energy coming after the election, starting with the Women's March and going into uh, the political races of the last uh, year and a half, we've seen um, college-educated primarily, suburban women moving away from the Republican Party because of the uh, performance that they have now been able to uh, too late. Uh, watch. Okay. Yeah. You wrote that two of the most difficult decisions of your life were staying married to Bill Clinton and running for Senate um, in New York. Would you include running for president? Yes. Yeah? Yes, yes, I would. Um, 
you know, I had, um, I had not even thought about running for political office myself until um, 1998 when um, Senator Pat, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said he was going to retire. And immediately, people started calling me from New York, asking me if I would run because uh, Giuliani had said he was going to run. And my friends in New York thought, well, you know, he will attract a lot of attention, he will get uh, a lot of money, and we've got to have somebody that can, you know, compete with that. And I said no for months. I, I thought it was, you know, a really far out idea. And I've told this before, but it really was the turning point because delegations of New Yorkers would come to see me and they would say, well, if you run, we'll give you this support. But I, I felt very uneasy about it. And until I was actually in, uh, I was in New York and I was going to a, uh, a school, a high school here uh, to uh, help launch a uh, series about women in sports. And, and my friend Billie Jean King and others were there, part of the program. Uh, and the, the title of the series was Dare to Compete. And so when I, I was introduced by this uh, young woman, she was, I think, the captain of the volleyball team or basketball team. She was, you know, very uh, fit and happy and, and terrific. <laughs> Uh, looking and gave a really nice introduction of me, and I, so I went up, and you know, I had to, I had to look up, and she had to bend down, and um, <laughs> so I said, "Well, that was wonderful. Thank you for that very generous introduction." And then she said to me, "Dare to compete, Mrs. Clinton. Dare to compete." And I felt like all of the, you know, all all of the worries and that I'd been having, you know, I had to face them, and I. I'd been somebody who had encouraged women to run for office. I'd supported a lot of women candidates. I was really um, proud of them. And now this young woman was telling me that. So I eventually, I decided to run. It was a great, it was a great campaign. And uh, I loved being um, a senator for eight years. And then something similar started happening around 2006. People began coming to me and saying, you know, you should think about running for president. You really need to think about this. And again, I was, pretty, um, I was pretty unconvinced. I thought, you know, I, I, don't, I, I just can't even, I, I can't think about this. And again, though, people kept sort of confronting me and I kept, I had to say to myself, do you not want to do it or are you afraid of doing it? And I concluded I was kind of afraid of doing it. And so if that were the reason, then I was going to be somewhat hypocritical going around telling everybody, particularly women, get out there and run if I was afraid to do it. So I began to think seriously about doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You've, um, you've also made many choices for love. In reading about your life, I was thinking about what if you hadn't gone to Arkansas very early on? Yeah. And um, I find myself, I should say that I, I spend a lot of time being very protective about you. And in my mind, I call you my auntie. So your auntie Hillary. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time being very protective of auntie Hillary. And when people talk about your personal life, I find it very irritating. Um, and having read quite a bit of your own writing about your life, I think that you have a marvelous love story. I really do. And it seems to me that you have just this wonderful friendship. Um, However, I have to say that I'm guilty of being interested in your personal life. <laughs> and the one question I have about that is about your Twitter account. So in your Twitter account, the first word that describes you is wife. And then I think it's mom and then it's grandmother. And, and when I saw that, I have to confess that I felt just a little bit upset. And then I went and I looked at your husband's Twitter account and the first word was not husband. And I wanted to ask, first of all, if this was your choice, if this was something that you um, wanted to do or something that maybe somebody thought would be a good idea for the campaign. Um, and if it's your choice, whether you think it's fair for me to have been a bit annoyed by it. <laughs> well, when you put it like that, I'm going to change it. <laughs> And 
know, I, I mean, there, there is always this, for me, I, I'll speak for myself, but I think it's broader than just me. There's always this internal conflict when you are very uh, committed to your relationships, your family, um, in my case, you know, parents and siblings and obviously my husband and my daughter and now my grandchildren and all, and, and your own identity and how you both feel about yourself and describe yourself. And, you know, yesterday I went to uh, Barbara Bush's, or Saturday I went to Barbara Bush's, yeah, that was yesterday, right? Yeah. I went to Barbara Bush's funeral, and you know, she gave a very uh, heartfelt speech at Wellesley in, I think, 1991, in which she said, you know, at the end of the day, it won't matter if you got a raise, it won't matter if you wrote a great uh, book, it won't, you know, if you are not also someone who values relationships. And, you know, she got a standing ovation after there was a lot of you know, concern and some uh, protest about her being invited to come speak. And I thought a lot about that because it shouldn't be either or. You know, it should be that if you, if you are um, someone who uh, is defining yourself by what you do and what you accomplish, and that is satisfying then more power to you, that is how you should be thinking about your life and living it. If you are someone who primarily defines your life in relationship to others, then more power to you and live that life the way Barbara Bush lived that life, you know, and, and how proud she was to do it. But I think most of us as women in today's world sort of end up in the middle wanting to have relationships, wanting to invest in them, nurture them, but also pursuing uh, our own interests. Um, and I loved the picture of Senator Tammy Duckworth coming onto the floor of the Senate with her little baby yes. in her jacket. <laughs> yes. and, and to me, that sort of summed it all up. And she is both. She's a mom, she's a senator, she's a combat veteran. You know, she is somebody who is trying to integrate all of the various aspects of her life. And, you know, that's what I've tried to do for a very, you know, very long time. And it's not easy, mm -hmm. but it is something that I've chosen to do and I think is best for me. So I'm going to keep, keep doing it, but I'm going to change my Twitter handle. Yeah. <laughs> I think... I think, I think what, may, may, if you, may I suggest what it should say? I think the first thing should say, <laughs> I think the first thing should say, should have been damn good president. <laughs> and then, and then mom, and then wife. <laughs> so, um, do you remember, so I've been reading, obviously been rereading all your books. Do you remember Susie O'Callaghan when you were growing up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was the little girl who bullied you. Yeah. And you came in crying to your mother. I did. And your mother said to you, go back there. If she hits you, you have my permission to hit her back. Yes, that's right. And, and I, in reading that, I thought about um, mostly your, your, your most recent campaign. And whether you, did you hit back often enough, do you think? I now do think you? I didn't. Mm. Um, and in, in the book, I write about that one particular incident where he was stalking me on the debate stage, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, here is one of, you know, people are always saying, well, you know, you need to talk about, you know, the mistakes you made. And, you know, I've been, I think, pretty uh, forthcoming about that. But one of the mistakes was that uh, it was really difficult to figure out how to deal with the first reality TV candidate. Mm -hmm in a reality TV campaign. Mm. You know, I've been around people who've run for president, I've supported them, obviously married one, uh, worked for another. Uh, so I was used to what was the norm, although you update it with technology, you do a better job of communicating. But the norm was, you know, you lay out what you're gonna do, you defend it, and at some point, usually in the debates, you know, one of the questioners will really try to pin you down. Like, okay, you say you're gonna get to universal healthcare coverage, how are you gonna do it, how are you gonna pay it? 
we didn't really get a lot of that in this campaign because the overwhelming story was my candidacy and his behavior. And so we were always trying to figure out how do you break through. And on that debate stage, I remember so well sort of thinking, like, what do I do? You know, I, I, did, I did practice to say what I wanted to say in the short period of time you're given. And all of a sudden, I know what he's doing. He's trying to intimidate me, but he's also sending a message to the audience that, you know, this is what a president looks like a guy who is gonna overpower people and, and you know, be dominant. So I'm thinking, well, do I turn around and I say, you know, back up, you creep. Um, uh, but, you know, by then I'd had enough experience that, you know, the, the, the coverage of it would have been, well, she can't take the pressure. Or she got angry. I mean, I say things in a normal tone, and I'm always amazed when the press said, she was so angry, and I think, well, you, you haven't seen anything if you thought <laughs> that was angry. Um, so I was, I was really struggling with it, and I concluded as I, I was, I think, expecting myself to, okay, you just have to be calm and in control, because uh, ultimately what the country wants is somebody who is not going to be blowing up in the Oval Office. They want somebody who well, is going think. to be able to deal with the problems. Well, you know, that did not work out so well. So <laughs> I did think about that. I mean, I remember thinking when people would say emails, 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 and I thought, I just, I thought half the people who are saying this don't have any idea what the hell they're talking about. And, and it just became something that was repeated. And, and I did sometimes feel that maybe your campaign needed to just, I don't know, maybe there was no answer. I mean, what you've said is true, which is that things are repeated so often that they start to just seem almost true. And I found it so frustrating because I thought this is rubbish, but we need to, but anyway, um, because so I, um, I want to ask you whether you're aware of how much of an inspiration you are to many people. And I mean that, and, and I say that, I, I, no, I, I, it's actually, re, it's, a, it's a serious question, which is because, um, so Rilke says that fame is the sum of misunderstandings that have gathered around the person. I think in your case, um, you know, those are just the most benign things often in the media is, is given an ominous coloration right? and I wonder if maybe that sometimes blinds you to what is another reality which is that you mean so much to so many people that you're um, just being right when you come on TV when my parents live in Nigeria but this, they, they come to visit the US quite often and whenever you're on TV my mother will say Odogu and Odogu in Igbo sort of means great one or sort of warrior right <laughs> and um, my mother, my mother is five years older than you are. And, but if, for women of her generation, for women of my generation, for women in between, across the world, I remember after the Beijing conference, how um, the idea of women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights just resonated so widely. And, and I ask you this because I think it's important um, I hope the answer is yes, but if it's not yes, I hope that you remember, I hope you remember actively how much you mean to so many people, so many people. Um, how, I feel, you know, I think your life, that your, 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 your life sort of as a public figure, starting from when you were um, first lady in Arkansas, in some ways it's sort of like a crucible of all the issues that affect women. So I was reading about your name, for example, how you had to take on Clinton because somehow, I guess if you didn't, then your husband wouldn't have won the election or something. But, but really, and, and issues of, you know, what, what is a woman's place and what does it mean? And, and it seems that your life has sort of been a crucible for all of that. And whether or not those things are resolved, I think there's been a bravery um, with which you've dealt with many of these things that continue to inspire people. So I just want you to remember it, please, especially when the bullshit happens. <laughs> well, you know, I, 
I, I very much appreciate your saying that, and it is part of the reason why um, I'm still out here talking so much, because, and writing, and, and doing whatever I can um, to stand up, because I, I really don't want to disappoint people who uh, supported me, who looked to me, and particularly young women. And for me, that is all about how um, we keep a sense of solidarity in some difficult times and how we stand up for each other. Uh, so I am uh, I'm conscious of that. I'm often a little embarrassed by it, but I, I'm grateful for it because be no, I, oh, I am a little, and, and you know because I I I feel so uh, blessed that I've had all these opportunities, but I also know how hard it is because I've lived it. And as people tell me their stories or tell me that I've encouraged them, uh, I I always say, well, you know, just just stick to your own truth, stick to your own. Uh, path and don't let people knock you off of it because I had to learn many years ago to take criticism seriously but not personally mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people and particularly when it comes to women whether it's the corporate world or academic or professional or political there are a lot of people who really still have trouble accepting a woman in authority and therefore, they are always looking for ways to denigrate and knock her off her own track. So I try to, and I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be a good example if I, you know, kind of gave up and went, uh, you know, off into the woods forever. Um, <laughs> I did have to come out of the woods, and so uh, when, I, when I did, I thought, okay, you know, this is a new chapter, and I'm going, I've got a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, feelings about what's happening, and I'm going to keep talking. So that's how I try to deal with it all. We hope you keep talking. And <laughs> yes. Actually, speaking of the woods, I remember when you were sighted in the woods a few times, and I started to think about going upstate New York to wander around in the woods and hopefully meet you. <laughs> but I'm happy that I ended up meeting you here. And um, please keep speaking, and please keep, you look so great. Hair on point, makeup on point, keep doing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Please, please join me one more time in thanking our guests tonight, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton.